This is the OGM Weekly Call on Thursday, November 30th, 2023. I almost said four. That was bad. Um, it is nice to see everybody. It is approaching so quickly, and I had no idea I would be like, on, when I write notes and I put the date on the corner of the paper, like, what am I doing writing 2023? That seems so futuristic somehow. Hey, everybody. Greetings, greetings, greetings. So nice to see you. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> good morning. Good, good morning. Good morning. Um, the weather forecast in Portland is like little droplets for like eight or nine days. Yesterday was yesterday was really nice, so we took a long walk, but it's little droplets for nine days ahead. That's no, normal. <laughs> is that common? Uh, rainy season, yeah. And, and then it's never just solid blah. It always opens up and then it's nice and then it gets cloudy and then it drizzles a little bit and then and we seldom get really big downpours. I notice, lived in Matt, notice, Matt. Notice, notice that you attribute nice to not wet. Uh, you know, drizzle is fine. You can sort of go out and do stuff. Downpour is fun, but you can't do much outdoors. <clears throat> so uh, I don't know. And, and of course, fun when it's warm. Of course, not fun when it's cold. Yeah, exactly. And also, like, we're in no danger of uh, drought uh, in in this particular piece. I think uh, Eastern Oregon is, in fact, uh, part of the drought zone. But yeah, but as not... it gets cold, Montana, it sort of gets much drier. Yeah, real fast, real fast. How much snow <laughs> do you get in in Oregon in your area? It'll snow uh, once, maybe twice a winter, and it'll stick on the ground for a week, maybe two weeks, uh, kind of per. <clears throat> and it, the, the first snow might stay until until thaw a little bit, but it, it's not bad. Not like Minnesota, though. <laughs> little, little different from Minnesota. Have you had snow already? Yes, we did. It lasted, it was, it was only, I don't know, half, three quarters of an inch, covered everything, and was gone within two days. Um, but we're starting to hit consistent temperatures at or slightly above freezing for the highs. Client of mine in western Michigan says he just got three inches a couple of days ago. Here we go, into the winter. <clears throat> Is it still on the ground or has it melted? Uh, as, it, as of a day after, it was still on the ground. Amazing. Um, we are in check-in mode this week, <clears throat> partly because I co-opted check-in mode to do an after-action review of our call about the Hamas situation, the Gaza situation before. And uh, I think everybody on the call knows the protocol, so I'm going to step out of the conversation. I will coach anybody who doesn't know the protocol who steps in later uh, in the chat. Shall we mute the chat for the whole check-in portion, or shall we allow the chat? I will go with consensus rule. I mean, Pete and I can create notes somewhere else and and satisfy our pent-up desires by pouring them into the chat once we're done checking in. But uh, it'd be fine to have open chat as far as I'm concerned. I, I had the impression that chat was more distracting when we were on a topic or something and maybe a, a little bit less distracting while we were checking in. But oh. maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Huh. I do not. I do not have that uh, that perception. Go ahead, G. Well, I sort of agree with that. I mean, it does take away from my attention to the verbal stuff if I'm tracking the chat. Um, but I think it's not that distracting, and it's able to be self managed. <laughs> By the handy measure of just closing the chat uh, during the check in period. So, uh, given that that's available, I will ask anybody who is disturbed by chat to just take it out of view and and rely on seeing it at the end. And in the meantime, we will um, chat away. I, during I, I have to suggest that. <laughs> yes. Turning off the chat does not fix it. Um, I mean, it, it means that whoever's, you know, turned off the chat isn't bombarded by it. But that, you know, it, if I were, if I didn't want the chat channel going on because I wanted everybody to pay attention, Turning it off for me doesn't help. It actually kind of makes it worse because it then I don't see what's going on, and you know people are still distracted. <laughs> just, just an observation. Uh, Stacy, I, I was going to echo that because I think the 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 whole issue with the chat is if you're the one speaking, you know it, it kind of makes you feel bad if somebody's chatting about something else and you're, you know, hoping for attention. 
onto well, what you're speaking about. It's as a little opposed bit like, to they're just throwing in a link that adds to what you're speaking about. It's it's a little like the modern thing where you're talking to somebody and they're looking at their phone while they're, you know. Right. It's like, exactly. Dude, <laughs> seriously? I hear an uprising in the ranks. I think maybe we should not chat. And and so and so and so Pete, for you and I, because we could secretly note take on the side and and then pour that in later, but that would mean we wouldn't be paying as much attention. Although you and I think that that would mean we would be paying just as much attention because that is how we pay attention. But that's a whole other conversation. Should you and I solemnly swear not to take notes during the check-in portion? It Yes, except that it's what? not clear to me that the the convention of the room was, or the uh, the consensus. consensus? In the room. It's not clear to me that the consensus in the room was that today was a no chat day. And we haven't defined the word consensus, which would take another couple of calls. Um, Stacy, please. How about in? How about as an exercise in autonomy, when you feel moved to use the chat, you stop, you check in. And then you make that decision for yourself and go with whatever consequences come. So you've just invented Quaker chat, <laughs> which could be a good cereal in India. Um, Gil. Yeah, I like the Quaker chat idea. Um, uh, I propose we have a future call about attention and paying attention. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, I, I, except apparently we're too distracted to have that call today. <laughs> <laughs> um, Not necessarily, it just detracts from the check-in. Yeah. Today, if if we do today's check-in with the Quaker Chat rules, then it's a laboratory for the question of attention that we can revisit at another call. I like that. So this, so in sense, you've reframed the call as an experiment. Okay. Okay. Can can somebody clarify for me, since I'm not a Quaker, what Quaker Chat rules are? <laughs> Ah, our quicker meeting is silent meeting, which means everybody goes into a room and goes quiet. And then whenever somebody is moved to speak, uh, they kind of first check in to see whether they're just responding to what somebody else said or whatever. They, they sort of, there's a little, there's a little um, process called vocal ministry, where you learn sort of what it's like to do a message in meeting. And uh, then typically during a quicker one hour long meeting, five or six people will stand up at some point randomly during the hour and say something that is for the meeting that is not supposed to be in reply to anybody else's message, but just supposed to be like showing up when you uh, hear the light, feel the light, seal the light. Speaking from the light is another phrase, I think. Uh, and then the, the saying that I like from Quakers is you should only break the silence to improve the silence. Um, and I've used that at retreats over the years. Um, Stacy, this is not nearly as dystopian as a Seinfeld episode. <laughs> it's very funny. The 90s were the decade of Friends and Seinfeld, and I couldn't stand either show. And, and to me, they said something about the 90s. I was like, nah, these are not good humans. Um, as opposed to the decade of Archie Bunker, which was like really examining social issues, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a lengthy preamble. Uh, I think we're agreed. What did we agree to? We agreed to not chat, uh, except when when so moved. So so to chat with a check in on intentions and and relevance. Is that good? Okay, so that's a modification to the S protocol. The Quaker modification to the S protocol. I like it. Uh, so I, I am going to go quiet, uh, either step in or use the hand to step into a queue, the Zoom hand. Uh, and uh, when we're done with the check-in, when everybody has checked in, I will step back in and we will change the rules and chat at will, um, as we usually do. So I'm passing the mic to whoever would like to check in.
I mean, the longer we wait, the more important the check-in has to be. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to un uh, unmute now. <laughs> so, so I can say something that seems kind of trivial, maybe not trivial, I don't know. Um, uh, some of you may know about Mastodon, the Fediverse uh, um, analog to Twitter. Um, I had an interesting experience uh, this week. I've been, I, Twitter, Twitter broke for me. Um, I, I won't mention names, but Twitter broke for me and um, I kind of have been off of it for a long time. And that kind of broke social media for me. Uh, so I've never really been a Facebook person. I, I just don't like Facebook at all. Um, even though I have an account there, but I was, I really loved Twitter and I got a lot of my news from it and, uh, it was a fun and happy place. Um, and I saw somewhere today, somebody was saying that, you know, Twitter's still there, X is still there, but it's like the soul got sucked out of it. It's a zombie of what it used to be. Um, so anyway, um, Twitter is, is drawing me back or something is drawing me back. I'm, I'm, I've got started with uh, AI art and NFTs again recently. Uh, another story, which I won't go into today. Um, but the interesting Mastodon thing was I had a mass, you know, I set up a Mastodon account um, and I thought I did the right thing by setting it up on a small community server um, because the promise of Mastodon for me was it that was was that it was decentralized and so you could kind of post anywhere and messages that would kind of float over the the decentralized network of mastodon and and uh everything's hunky-dory and not like a centralized thing like twitter or facebook so um with the help of some friends from uh a, a kind of an ogm -y, o ogm related uh subgroup called fellowship of the link yesterday um uh, I had to move uh, the the little community server that I was on never really got going. Um, it was a few dozen people and and the, the the way Mastodon is set up, it's not really it doesn't make a cohesive community very well. You have to put the community around around it and then have a server instead of the other way around. Making a server doesn't make a community. So we didn't really have a big community. We didn't, we weren't really active. The guy who was running, it was like, oh my God, I thought this was going to be big. And I'm, so I'm paying $42 a month for a big Mastodon server that nobody's using. So I'm going to have to switch domains and, and move someplace else. Um, that was enough for me to go, okay, well, I've had it with the little, the little baby server thing. And I'm just going to move on to the biggest Mastodon server, the one that's kind of semi-official. Um, and... So long story short, it, it, I, I realized um, that, that I was a bit sad, but I realized that, that even Mastodon, it's basically like smaller copies of Twitter. Um, uh, even though the architecture is supposed to be decentralized and there is a little bit of like messages flow around. If you wanna see most of the messages, you kind of have to join the biggest server. Um, and if you're on a little server, um, you won't get what's flowing around the Fediverse. Um, and I was really disappointed to find this because, um, you know, the, the promise to me at least was this decentralized, we can kind of post everywhere and it'll kind of work out. It doesn't work that way. Um, it is really cool comparing Mastodon to Twitter that you can have as many big or little, you know, Twitter-like things uh, with Mastodon but they don't talk very well uh, amongst each other. So that's my big epiphany that Mastodon is kind of like open source Twitters. Um, you can have as many as you want and they can be big and small, but if you want, you know, kind of the feel of Twitter, maybe you go to Blue Sky, another story, um, or you go to mastodon.social. So now I've got, you know, I, I transferred my account over to Mastodon Social. It's very cool. Mastodon is built so that you can move from server to server very easily. So that worked. Um, but I'm really sad that the promise of decentralized, you know, um, Fediverse didn't work out. Um, the a competing thing, uh, we talked about Nostra a little bit yesterday. Um, Nostra is a competing thing that is like very decentralized, but then there's no there there kind of, it just kind of like dissipates all over the place. <clears throat> Long story short, I, the, I, I, it, it, I was hurt by thinking that decentralization was farther along than it, than it is. And, you know, it, it's cool and we should work, keep working on it. Um, and I'll keep working on it, but it's not quite there yet. Thanks.
Uh, hi. Um, yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, I've also been thinking about decentralized social networks and um, I'm thinking in terms of education, like would it make sense to have a class use a social network where people keep their own data private, but they own their own data and uh, they choose what's shared with the class or with the school. Um, so, but I don't know how to get there. <laughs> I mean, there were attempts like using the DAT protocol to uh, build your own social networks, but they were just experiments. So it's still, the landscape is still tricky and there are new advances to help people like get beyond the home network router issues to be able to you know, get on these networks and share and contribute from your home network. Um, that's called hole punch, but yeah, like I keep, so if, when I find some time to look at it, I'll, okay, I'll see, okay, that's now evolved into hole punch. And now I got to look at their new, <laughs> what's the latest here. It's, it's constantly evolving and like things that used to work for me, like the uh, command line, they don't support anymore. So it's frustrating, but I think it's where we need to get eventually, and um, I hope that um, the community keeps pushing for it, even though it's very hard to make a business case for it. So we'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, I've also had uh, a week of struggling with software and, and uh, getting my mind wrapped around uh, um, these communication tools that are emerging, which are just incredibly complex. And, and it will probably take, will take a while for this to sort itself out where uh, the, some systems just prevail. But uh, I was in a meeting this morning where Gene Bellinger presented um, a large language model that actually, it's a, basically a GPT that uh, can program Kumo. So you can talk with it. It's basically already an LLM. Um, and then it starts drawing um, relationship maps. Uh, it's still, it's still so between alpha and beta, but you can see this, uh, you can see this coming on. So, you know, so he's now creating groups where um, you can to advance this and, 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 and work it. But this then, then would allow someone like me, I mean, I've always been stymied by trying to develop a Kumo map or program a Kumo map. It just blows my mind. <laughs> but if I can talk to it, hey, I can do this. You know, that, that, that's, uh, that's pretty incredible. Um, then I've gotten into Substack, and that is exploding. Um, it seems like everybody is testing their mailing lists to uh, send out a first draft release and then see who gets stuck on it and generates interest. So it's really important to polish this introduction to the point where you can make it clear what you have in mind and why what you want to talk about should be of interest now. And there are some very smart people doing this. Now. So now I'm on the receiving end of uh, the Substack messages and it's super impressive. It's, I mean, it's intimidating, right? Because um, you, try to, you try to keep up and then I just published a, a, a website. I mean, I redid uh, an old website. I have a, a uh, domain called Food with Thought that uh, um, that I was able to release again, but then you get into, holy smokes, uh, what do you do with your email and how they, you know, it's just, it's just amazing, you know, to, to, uh, to try to stay on top of it, to try to stay with it. But at the same time, I think what you what we're observing is sort of an explosion in collective intelligence, right? Because the information that's getting around is just um, uh, it's just uh, uh, 
uh, very impressive, you know, how how uh, information finds you. You know, I think the algorithms are uh, improving in, in that uh, uh, information is routed to you that's relevant to you. Um, and that's that's uh, that's also, of course, very dangerous because you know, it can be it can be misused. And that's actually, um, I mean, one reason why I'm I'm so intensely focused right now is because COP twenty eight, for the first time, has a full day dedicated to food systems, um, and the amount of of rancor uh, around this is incredible. You know, there, there is targeted misinformation. You know, so I, I uh, uh, came across, uh, uh, I, I just I just ran a test because um, in the Neo book, Paul Question, you know, where I'm, I'm trying to stake out a pathway to change, um, I mean, it became pretty obvious that that um, you have to anticipate entrenched interests refusing to yield, right? So I just run a quick test, and I came across the Heartland uh, 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 organization sending out a book to two hundred thousand teachers in how they should talk about climate change. Uh, combined with a CD that talks them through it. I mean, that's just incredible that this can happen in a democracy where, you know, you just have an organization sending false information, I mean, completely misleading information to, to all the teachers, right? Uh, for K-12 uh, uh, instructions, this is how they should talk about climate change. And so in the food system, we have that same thing, that level it's it's very refined, very um, subtle, you know, in the way that it wants to perpetuate existing practices that are so destructive. So so uh, so on the one hand, you have these tools, right, and and, and you can't really function in this in this uh, setting without being able to understand without understanding and using these tools. So that's a huge challenge. Uh, for someone like me, where I don't have any formal training to to really uh, to really get into this, so that's sort of uh, where I'm at. I mean, I'm just really trying to get a to get uh, a a handle on these tools, and then B find a way to stay inserted in this communications flow um, that is evolving. Uh, in in the food and agriculture sector, and that's getting, uh, that's really uh, wanting wanting to 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 gain traction. Um, <clears throat> morning, everybody. Um, I can see that I'm not well trained in Quaker meeting uh, because I'm drawn to respond or, uh, to things that I've heard or pick up on things that I've heard. And I'm going to do that a little bit and then say other things that, that uh, what's the phrase, Jerry? Um, speaking from the light, that's pretty good. Yeah, uh, speaking from the light, you should only break the silence to improve the silence as you know. Hopefully, we'll see. Um, <clears throat> Um, so Pete, thank you for the uh, tips on Mastodon. I've been I've been perplexed by why so little relevant traffic, uh, and disappointed compared to what I've seen on other platforms. I haven't been as active there as I would have liked to be, and I will now try again um, with your new model. Um, um, I made a list last week or two of all the networks that I'm trying to have really <laughs> relationships with. Uh, you know, from the from the Twitter, Mastodon, Blue Sky Universe to Facebook to OGM and Open Global Mind and schooling. It's like it's 
it's crazy overwhelming cause you talked about uh, trying to keep up. Uh, Ken, uh, wiser than most of us, has just unplugged from a lot of this shit decades ago and is not troubled by it. Um, um, so that's just kind of a crazy mystery to me. I'm trying, trying, trying to think about how to rationalize and systematize and focus what I'm doing and have the pieces connect more wisely, um, like a kind of a cross-publishing scheme. Um, what was I going to say about that? Um, I've been very active on Facebook in the aftermath of, of the of the Gaza crisis, um, um, less so the last week or two, and I'm really struck <clears throat> there and elsewhere at the um, not just the shallowness but the ignorance of the public conversation. Part of this is what you know, Klaus, we're talking about disinformation as a as an orchestrated strategy in our society these days. Uh, but also the, um, the common tendency of people to react with very strong opinions with very little knowledge of a situation. The extreme case of that is people going ballistic on a headline, not having read the story. And of course, headlines aren't written by the journalists who wrote the story. It's written by headline writers for a particular purpose, for different purposes with different publications. So I'm um, I'm sad about that and um you know have made little efforts to clean some conversations up but that's like sweeping the beach and i'm not going to spend my life doing that um, <clears throat> um uh, a, a very well not exact <clears throat> not exactly the same conversation but related to that i was on a call yesterday about sociocracy and governance systems. And um, I don't want to, I don't want to malign people by saying the conversation was superficial, but it felt very naive to me. Um, um, it felt like there was an assumption that, that a different, that a, that a different protocol can shift human behavior. And the question of taking that to scale from groups of 10 or 20 or 30 to groups of hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands wasn't in the conversation. Um, the question of how how to combine democracy and agility um, and um, consensus or various other kinds of models with with innovation uh, uh, just didn't seem to be there in the conversation. I'll confess that I'm very, my it, my own experience on sociocracy and things like that is very shallow at this point. So I'm, I'm applying my criticism of others to myself. Um, but um, I was listening from the perspective of a guy trying to put together a cooperative holding company, uh, a, you know, a holding company full of cooperative businesses that cross own each other uh, and that don't just uh, uh, share ownership, but share governance. And so I'm immersed in trying to think about how that works. Um, and um, I'm not feeling very enlightened from what I'm seeing so far. So that's very much on my mind. Oh, w one thing that did become clear in that conversation is that is that there's a muddiness about govern uh, governance and ownership, and they're not the same. And they're related, and they can be synergistic or not, but lots to explore there. And much of that comes, uh, the, the question of trust, Jerry, which is a field you've been playing in for a long time, is fundamental. Uh, in the story of so how is trust built and broken and reestablished and nurtured uh, <clears throat> is is very much alive in me right now. Um, two other things, real quick uh, on the matter, Klaus. Thank you for the GPT to Kumu thing. I've been playing in AIs lately. I have a gentleman in London who's been building LLMs uh, based on different corpuses of stuff that I have. Um, and uh, one of which we've trained it on the four years of living between worlds conversations, which we'll preview at next month's so December, Ken, what is it, December 20th? Um, third Wednesday of every month. So we'll, we'll put the model into the conversation and let people participating in the call interact with it and see, see if it's valuable or useful in any kind of way. So I'm intrigued by that whole game. Um, uh, I mentioned before the call started, I was listening this morning to a lecture by John Searle, 
philosophy professor at UC Berkeley uh, speaking to Google about AI. Um, um, he, I haven't gotten to the point yet, but I think he's going to come around to what my wife Jane has been set, calling it for years as simulated intelligence, not artificial intelligence. A very interesting formal schema for his analysis. I put the link in the chat way back at the top, so have a look there. Um, uh, on on the COP28 climate conference and the intersection with the social media conversation, I started propagating a meme yesterday called uh, hashtag cop out. Um, and it's getting picked up, <clears throat> excuse me, it's getting picked up very fast. So that's kind of a fun experiment there um, as we watch this, uh, <clears throat> this strange international groping towards something led by an executive from the UAE oil company uh, with memos that were just discovered yesterday about how he plans to use the COP to further oil deals. So uh, we're in a mess. Um, one of my most respected climate mappers and tractors said that he couldn't get into the ministry for the future, uh, which I think is one of the more profound and important books on climate out these days. So that was kind of intriguing. And uh, I have to leave at the top of the hour for another call. So thank you for the chance to share. In the I'll try the challenge of not responding to a bunch of things that come up that get triggered. Uh, what's been uh, being brought to my attention increasingly is storytelling. And there's a lot of um, things around that. I'm actually looking to uh, the one of the groups I was in years ago, um, we actually organized the Smithsonian Storytelling Weekend and things. Um, one of my big projects would be to see if we could rekindle that next summer. Um, July 20th is Saturday, and that'll be the 55th anniversary of Apollo 11. So I'm trying to see if that could be a context to really try to um, bring things together there. I've, um, the, and then um, I'm also part of the International Society of S uh, System Sciences and we'll be having our 2024 conference will be in DC in the like, third week of June and things. So. Um, a lot of things that are going on there. About, I guess it, it boils down to different fa the facilitation methods. So that, that's, so I'm kind of trying to really zoom in on strategic leverage points. Uh, with facilitation, it's really interesting too, with the pieces that have been um, coming back. Of, like with, with the brain, I've been, I got introduced to, um, to Jeff Conklin and the whole dialogue mapping, issue mapping process. If you're familiar with that. And, um, he's, um, well, it's interesting because they did separate it out, um, but Jeff's energy has always been around the dialogue mapping, uh, creating these maps in real time on shared screens. Uh, so he's got maps of maps of maps of like the climate change thing that was in Copenhagen. Um, type of thing, but and then there another one is uh, Edward de Bono and the six thinking hats and things. But it's interesting, Edward de Bono and Jeff, they're so obsessed with using it in meetings that they're not, it's kind of ignoring the power of it for individual sense making and things. So that's kind of where I'm, I'm interested. Um, and then again, and then actually trying the compendium, uh, it's the open source conundrum there of uh, had two, you had the version Jeff developed, I guess you could call it the time nexus distribution. And then there was Simon Buckingham Shum in the open UK. And 
Al Selden and stuff, um, they, they were using Compendium, but then they took it in some different directions and things. But uh, when Al died, it just kind of um, withered. He was really seemed to be the energy behind it. And um, so can I'm looking at, can I kind of try to bring that functionality into the brain since that's been my tool um, and things. But yeah, so really the strategic leverage points I see are, the, are um, storytelling and facilitating. And then I guess getting into that, um, into the sense makings and it all kind of um, gets into the whole decision making process too uh, and that we need to be <laughs> all you can do is make the best decision the big um, you have a like obligation to be come as well informed and then it's like you make this decision but then you also have to can we get systems intelligence that will recognize that we're on, <laughs> that's not working we need to come we need to take correct other corrective actions and stuff so rather than being so locked into something. So I'll stop there, but. So. Uh, Judy, you're muted. It seems to me that, that there's a, a really important theme here. It's not a new one, but it's becoming a burgeoning challenge. And, and it all relies, it builds around the question of trust, but specifically for me in this conversation around information integrity and how do you determine what is worthy information and how can you check that out and, and how can you inform others about the lack of integrity of information, which leads to foundational changes in thinking that it's sort of like, how do we bridge the human trust into an organizational dimension? And some organizations themselves have a climate of trust and a sense of integrity of information and authenticity and so forth, but it's very difficult to discern when you're out in the world and you're just meeting and greeting and trying to determine how to learn more about a topic that you're concerned about and know that you're getting valid information. It's sort of like there needs to be an integrity or trust meter that can be applied because we now have so many fragmented sources of information that it's almost impossible to vet the quality of that particular source of information. And that might be worthy of a longer call, a focus call, as opposed to a check-in call. But I think this is a group that could address the limitations of in information accuracy, the current ways that one can guard against misinformation, and, and how to then use that in terms of the general public. And I'm thinking particularly in terms of the youth and rising generations of the world. We're the aging generation of the world and we look at the world differently, but if everyone's based on a sound bite, then how do we as a society of humans make sense of what's real and what isn't real and discern as has just been mentioned when a topic that's supposed to be internationally imbalanced is being co-opted. So, I don't have an answer, it's a huge question, but it seems to me that this group would be a really good group to do some serious work about it. And then in the course of that, figure out how to share that information or knowledge or growing wisdom with different groups of people.
I keep wanting Gil's Fathom note taker to jump in and take a turn. Soon enough. Soon enough that will happen. It's more disciplined than I am. <clears throat> and yeah, it might be compelled to reply to what everybody else said. I don't I don't know what'll happen. Um in the spirit of checking in, I'm i I've, I've been struggling to explain myself online to sort of say what's going on and uh, after some advice midsummer, I tried to simplify what I was saying and ended up in very unsatisfactory kind of dead end alleys. Because when I simplified, when I simplified a lot, what I was trying to do sounds uninteresting and vanilla. And I was like, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't hire that person or whatever. Um, so I'm, I, I went to the alternate strategy of trying to explain my complexity and the complexity of the intertwingularity of things that I see, uh, which is daunting to say the least and so i'm i'm busy trying to experiment and i feel like uh, I, I wish i could use massive wiki 10 years hence fully funded and all singing all dancing because i think pete and my visions for what's possible uh, with massive are very aligned uh, and there's just so many things that are interesting and why you know one and part of the problem is that there are many angles at which i'm tackling these different things i care about like collective memory, <clears throat> trust, and sense-making. Um, and one of those angles is, um, well, actually, I just forgot the one that I was gonna, gonna talk about. Um, oh, uh, one of those is the observation, which I did a, a YouTube short about that, we're, that the web, the internet is stuck in mainstream media metaphors, that we have TV and radio, and we have newspapers, magazines, and books, and we have uh, phone calls with video, woo. And we don't have a whole lot, we got transactions, you can go buy stuff. And we don't have a lot of other stuff. And, and even the, a lot of the media that, we're, that I just listed are kind of hard to reuse and hard to repurpose and hard to weave together. And I'm really interested in trying to push media to some new level of utility for everybody. And that's, that's hard, but fun and interesting. And that that's sort of one of the layers of, of experimentation that I'm trying to do. Um, so I'm, I'm busy trying to figure, figure that out. And um, I, I think I'll, I think I'll leave it there. Sorry for having come in late. Uh, so, uh, what I have to say might not fit anymore, but uh, I have the feeling that this meeting has become somewhat dysfunctional. I used to believe that we had busy lives outside of open mind, and we came here and got relief by being able to be free and play at the edges. I no longer believe it. I don't think we're engaged with climate change, for example, outside this meeting in very effective ways. So we've become a group that is not talking about the most important thing that's going on, which seems to me just bizarre. So I'll stop there. I think that this meeting has become more functional, but I'm looking from a different point. So I've been in um, North Carolina with my friend whose husband passed 
Um, I wanted to be here to spend the holidays with her. These are gonna be her first holidays alone. So I am in the wilderness. I have the woods on one side, the lake on the other side. And I, I really can imagine what Gil's going through on Facebook. I haven't been there in a while. <laughs> I don't wanna be there, mostly because of what Judith talked about, which is a big concern for me, but there's nothing I can do right now. I'll go back when the time is right. But most of my time and attention has been really on me in the being. I, I, I wish Doug Breitbart was here. <laughs> so in really <laughs> being me. And the reason that I say that I think this group is more functional, I feel that when the, I mean, this is just my opinion. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. But I feel like each one of you is bringing so much more of who you really are, as opposed to who you want to put out to the world for whatever reasons, you know, whatever, for whatever protection or whatever mechanisms, you know, we, we carry with us for the world. So in that regard, and to speak to what Gil was, uh, what Gil was saying earlier about when he was talking about listening to sociocracy and wondering how we, like what about the actual people in the system? Because that has to change. So for me, I see, so I see a lot of positive growth in this group. So yeah, maybe we're not, you know, or you guys aren't talking about what you see as solutions, but a lot of that was talk. And talk is great, it generates ideas. But there's, a lot, there's a lot already out there as far as I know. This particular group, I think is, to me, I see this as, um, I don't know, this is like a smorgasbord group. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna stop here. Uh, um, <coughs> when I came, it's nice to be here.
Um, so I've been uh, one thing that came up for recently. I was reading a book, uh, and I think I had known this before, but I hadn't really paid attention to it. That one of the issues Charles Darwin had about publishing *The Origin of Species* was that in that time, and he was pretty firm about it, that although he had this explanation for <clears throat> variation and change and how things evolve, there was no purpose to it. When in the 1850s, people were very much engaged in that there was sort of a providential order to life, the universe. Um, uh, Douglas Carmichael pointed this out in Garden World um, about uh, and that, and uh, also um, others, you know, Max Weber and others point out this kind of nihilistic thing that happened with uh, moving away from everyone just agreeing that, you know, there's a God and it's all good and it's going in a great direction because it's got a purpose. And so that's just thrown me into like, <laughs> which also fits with some of the Zen teachings I had experience with about uh, purpose and ultimate purpose. So I think part of what's happening and that makes it, I kind of feel it like a malaise, a social malaise in our or maybe part of our zeitgeist that we are struggling with this as a society, as individuals, as a world filled with people and trying to Im either impugn purpose, you know, put it somewhere um, but I'm not I just I just have to leave it like that Oh, I will share one more thing. Um, last week, for the first time, I had what I would call a social dream. That is a dream that I feel is part of the zeitgeist of our time about uh, AI. And I made some quick notes, but it was both unsettling I was in very serious arguments with good friends of mine about philosophy. And I felt, I said, my last note to myself is I felt like I was staring into some kind of an abyss. So I'll just leave that. That I'm in this, it's a very interesting, I think we're in an age where we, where we are somehow struggling with uh, the lack of a spiritual sort of underpinning that everybody like just agrees to, even if they didn't quite believe all the, you know, heaven and hell thing. One of the thing, kind of the several people kind of either brought it up directly or kind of alluded to us having some gatherings outside this group too to kind of maybe talk about you know or some of the projects or how we get to some things. So I don't know if we can tied into that or maybe it could even be a session like uh, like as people like uh, what's your vision for 2024 or something as we approach the end of the year or something so
Kevin, you may have deduced that we're in check-in mode and you're welcome to step in whenever you want and the pause is welcome. Okay. <clears throat> well, I, I will say that I'm in <clears throat> AA and what you say in AA is that you're not here if you have a one-day reprieve contingent on your spiritual condition. <clears throat> and uh, for those who have trouble coping with spirituality the chapter to the agnostic in the big book is really good because it it enables atheists and near atheists to act as if there is something spiritual that help gives them an, a grounding without violating their what they firmly don't believe and it, so it's a as bill said it's 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 a functional necessity <clears throat> to act as if you're not in a closed room with no windows so. So I'm going to make one post to the chat and things uh, it's with um, one of my primary mentors is uh, um, Bill Smith he had um, worked at uh, actually British Overseas Airway Corporation back in the, when he was in his early 20s and he was really successful sometimes and uh, so he's kind of dedicated his life to figuring out trying to figure out why he was successful and um, sometimes and other times not but what he came in to he's got um well, purpose that like, ties into the conversation, and so purpose is a source of power. And of course, everybody, when you try to talk to certain people about purpose, then it's all religion stuff. So I've kind of tried to frame it as it's the authentic commitment to your purpose is what draws people. So he has uh, appreciation, influence, and control. So can controls kind of power over um, influences power with um, and then the latest thing we used to talk about power for but actually we're talking about appreciation as power beyond and uh, he's been getting some real traction in the IFSS he's actually the vice president for practice now so that's another sound that's one of my main threads is this i triple s um, conference in june uh, and things but i'll post the link to um, some of his articles and uh, uh but to particularly if anybody is a member of i triple s already uh, to um, things i'll be organizing some things and i'll invite um, this group to them as well so um, Carl, I'm going to play moderator a little bit here. We're still in the check-in mode where you only speak once. Okay. I thought um, we focused Michael. Uh, no, we were, there's a couple people who haven't uh, stepped in yet. Um, and when, when that happens, I'll switch us over. But thanks. But I appreciate your comments. And if I'm wrong and everybody's gone already, correct me, but I think there's a few who haven't. I can check in, but it would be uh, very brief, which is that I'm preparing for Seagraph Asia uh, starting in 10 days. And so I've been completely focused on that and, not, and really not much else, just that and there. I'll do a check-in on our uh, Rights of the River <clears throat> Network. We've got two uh, environmental uh, professors from Warren Wilson College and two students working on it and on the, <clears throat> both writing a new ordinance 
and um, doing figuring out the marketing. We've got a state legislator who's really interested in is doing her own bill and uh, <clears throat> moving forward with that collaborative, but it's all volunteer. And you got to deal with somebody who's really entitled and doesn't show up to work and all that kind of stuff that's purely volunteer, but there's some really good ones. So it's just, anyway, it's moving forward. I've yet to check in, but uh, don't have much to say at the moment. So I'll leave there. I appreciate that. And uh, Ken passed in the chat. And I think that's John Kelly on iPhone 11. And That's right. And if you'd like to check in, that'd be great. Yeah, I just... So I can talk. Um... Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm always late to these things, <laughs> or just or are gone. I'm I'm usually working uh, Thursday morning with a caregiver, you know, with caregiving clients. Um, and the quick check in would be that um, that's what I do every week. I've got three people who are um, need extra assistance in one form or another, and um, that's really um, well. Yeah, that's a whole book, you know, that what that work is like, what it requires, what it does for you, what it takes from you, etc. I'm also um, writing a novel. Uh, I'm at 13 chapters, 40,000 words. I have re I came up with a new introduction, which, you know, I came in here late, but it, it sounded like you were discussing a little bit uh, spirituality without uh, conventional uh, structures. And I, that's certainly, I, Jerry can <laughs> say whether that introduction I came up with, in fact, um, speaks to that or speaks from that, actually, uh, created a, a disembodied being who is my, uh, my opener to the, to the novel. So on, on a bad day, I can say, you know, who do you think you are? <laughs> you know, it's Kim Stanley Robinson? You know, don't kid yourself. But on a good day, I could say, no, no, that's not the question. The question is, is there a book here that nobody else could write? And just get it written, you know, and the rest, you know, we'll, we'll deal with elsewhere. So that's probably enough for a check-in for me today. Good to hear from, hear and see those you I've heard and seen so far in this talk. John, thank you. And uh, whatever time you can come to spend with us, we appreciate. We realize you've got commitments and responsibilities. So thank you for for making time to to be here. Um, I think that's everybody checked in. I'll switch. I'll switch the big toggle into normal conversation mode. We've only got a quarter of an hour left. Um, but what is, I, and I think I, I misunderstood at the beginning when Gil was talking about, I think it was Gil who mentioned uh, GPT for, and I heard COBOL, but I think it was GPT Kumu. for Kumu. Dang, okay, I gotta, I gotta change that around. So there's a GPT that'll help to create Kumu maps, which is a, a much cooler thing than GPT that speaks COBOL. Um, and, and if I may, a simple way to think of a GPT um, it's a natural language interface to something. Um, so in, in, you know, you don't have to like overcomplicate it with, you know, oh my God, it's thinking or it's going to take over the world or whatever, you know, a GPT is a way to speak natural language and get it to do something like to Kumu. And do we have a link to the GPT that can program Kumu? Is that a... I, I bet we can source one. Um, so uh, what else is in, on people's minds? I, I'm So I, this question about people need some belief system to hang on to is really, really interesting to me. Super fascinating. Uh, one of the big trends out there right now is nuns. <clears throat> and I don't mean N-U-N-S. I mean N-O-N-E-S, which means people who are um, spiritual but not religious or something like that. Kind of hard to declare. <clears throat> but... 
they do believe in some kind of power, but they're not interested in any of the organized religions. That that segment of the population is growing and growing pretty quickly. Um, and I think that modern modernist liberal society has done a really shitty job of giving people even places to come convene and think about a belief system that might like work or hang or or resonate for them. Uh, so the nuns are kind of fishing around. And one of the problems is when you're fishing around and, and there's nothing that that really is working collectively, you will seize sometimes onto really stupid uh, theories or cults or whatever else. And so a bunch of people are, are ripe for the picking, I think, for, for not so healthy ideas for society. Um, so I'm really interested in that. And in a fit of peak around this kind of question, years ago, I bought the domain foobarism.com. A couple of you know about that. There's not much on the site, but a foobar is a placeholder file name in programming. Uh, foo.bar is what you'll put in sometimes in code when you're just doing sample code or want a sample file name. It's based on foobar fucked up beyond all recognition, which I think dates back to World War I when someone would show up and say, hey, Sergeant, how's the situation in the trench? They foobar, sir, <clears throat> and on from there. So it's meant to be um, a placeholder religion, foobar. And I'd be happy to collaborate with anyone who wants to do more about it. But uh, it's meant to be a very tongue-in-cheek exercise about a very serious question, uh, which is, what would you put, if you could invent a religion, what would you put in it? Uh, and when I use the word religion in lowercase and very lightly there. Um, it's called a metastatic, metasyntactic syntactic variable. I did not know that. Thank you. I will add that. And there's a, Julian has the book. Awesome. Two copies of the uh, FUBAR and SNAFU. Nice. There, which are, of course, totally related. Situation normal, all fucked up. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, but, I posted about um, SANFU, situation abnormal, not fucked up. Love that. <laughs> um, so Unless anyway, I any, forget picnic. Uh, what was picnic? Picnic is problem in chair, not in computer. Oh, right, right. Thank you. And then uh, PEBCAC is the other one. You remember PEBCAC? Problem exists between chair and keyboard. Um, anything else that popped up in people's heads that they'd like to talk about? Well, on this idea of religion, spirituality, God, creator, whatever, um, one of the things I found very useful in, in my coaching practice is to talk about spiritual intelligence, not from the standpoint of religion, but spiritual intelligence is whatever makes you feel connected to something larger than yourself and for some people that is god that is their religion for some people it's their community or their family for some people it's their work or nature um when that is missing then it's very hard to have uh, a life of meaning and purpose and when it's present even in the midst of of terrible uh challenges it's um, much easier to have a life of meaning and purpose and you know i'm not um I'm not someone, I'm not a theist. I don't believe in a God, or you know, I should say, I actually believe in all the gods except one that says I'm the only way, because that's a very troublesome God. Um, but I look at uh, the evolution of the black church, and I, I think of, you know, a, a dear friend of mine who says, you know, my ancestors were here as slaves 200 years ago, and, and you know, they had nothing. They, they had no rights, nothing. And, and you almost, if you're in that position, you would almost have to invent an afterlife and a God that says, once you get through this, you will be rewarded. And so I have tremendous respect for um, that as a, as a survival strategy, as something that can help you move through really dark wilderness and, you know, the desert where you're just, you know, it feels like you've been abandoned. So um, it's certainly something that occupies the the minds of a great many people on this planet and there's all these ways of unpacking it depending upon where you are but um it feels like a, a fairly universal thing to for a need to feel connected to something larger than yourself whatever that might be and so i just uh so i throw that in
So this isn't well thought out, but since it's make believe in going to Fubor, imagine if sound were the God, then each one of us in everything we speak were God. That would automatically put a responsibility and a mindfulness in our focus. So that's just what came to me. I figured I'd share it. <laughs> You have just made what I love about Quakerism. Uh, because the fundamental belief of Quakerism is that God is in everyone. And it doesn't necessarily do it from the voice, but it starts with that assumption, which means if if I harm you, I'm harming me. Why would I do that? And uh, it also means that people have sort of a sacred presence that is worth honoring. So Quakers, uh, many of Orthodox-ish Quakers would speak in plain speak, which is thou and thee. And the reason for it wasn't to be ornate, the reason for it was to sort of sacralize the address of the other. Like, you know, uh, instead of just you, hey, buddy, it was thou. Um, and it, which I find I've never tried doing that for a day, uh, but I find that's really uh, interesting. And if I could just pull in one more point that came to me as you were speaking, um, because the notion of sound is very important to me, but listening to you speak, I'm realizing you know, men's history has always been written where women's history seems to have been told in story or sung. So I think there, for me at least, there's something really important in putting it into sound <laughs> as opposed to writing or thinking that the next step. Um, two thoughts on that, Stacey. One, it's, it's kind of funny that it's called his story and there are puns about her story. Uh, and the second is that literate traditions, the people of the word, I say that with with some with weight on where that comes from, um, deprecate oral uh, traditions, singing traditions, uh, all those kinds of things. And I think I, I'm projecting here, but I think very often think that nothing of sophistication could be passed down through oral traditions or just by by mentoring or word of mouth or coaching or apprenticeship or whatever else. And I think that that's totally wrong. And and my uh, my head's been spun around with you know the dawn of everything and plenty of other books about how sophisticated and interesting and in many cases how humane uh, and advanced pre word societies were. And I'll add a third thought, which is the thesis of the alphabet versus the goddess, Leonard Schlein's book, uh, is that uh, linear writing fucks up our brains. That that before linear writing, we have very balanced kind of a yin and yang is balanced kind of kind of worldviews in many cultures that had succeeded up to that stage. And then he goes around the world in this book, and I think he pushes the thesis a little too hard, but I really like it. And he says, look at Greece, for example, pre-alphabet Greece and post-alphabet Greece. Pre-alphabet Greece, you have Diana, badass uh, goddess of the hunt. Uh, you have Pan and a whole bunch of characters, Bacchus. There's a whole there's a whole pantheon of pre-alphabet Greece that's different from uh, post-alphabet, where you have men giving birth from their head and thigh, and uh, women are deprecated. And there's a I've said before the the pushing aside of the divine feminine is one of his plot points, uh, which I really like. Um, but uh, but the alphabet might in fact have been part of our problem in many ways, even though it's given us the ability. Like Michael's background is a, a wall full of shelves. Uh, Julian was showing us books on his bookcase. Bill Anderson talked about books and has books right there in the background. Books are everywhere. Ken's got some book a bookshelf shelf right behind him. Uh, so, it's actually so CDs. Ah, it's all that's the, that's your CD bookcase. That's, that's so cool. That's one of one of three. Holy beans! <laughs> so that's what happened when you didn't when you get got rid of your TV in nineteen ninety. Yeah, I, I just, I, I read and listen to music. That's hilarious. I love it. Uh, Julian, please. I was going to mention that the his story, her story thing is more than a pun because it's actually now memorialized in the Computer Graphics History Project. I could easily reel off a, a list of female monster mathematicians and I never did not want to see them get relegated just because of their gender. And then as you were talking about uh, history becoming linear, that's another thing that I'm fighting in this computer graphics history project. And there, there will be a lot more to show <clears throat> as it gets developed over the next eight months. Because, uh, yeah, the idea is, and I think Edward Tufte has talked about this also 
in his rants against PowerPoint, the idea that everything can be shoved and funneled into a single stream is just not reality. It's a way to make things easy to try to deal with, but we have the technology now where we don't have to limit ourselves to the anachronisms of the last few millennia. Now I'm extra interested in your conference. Gary, I think you you inadvertently made a little slip there. Um, Diana was Roman, Artemis would be Greece. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm not that good on the gods and goddesses, so I don't. I put them. I misplace them on the shelves often. Yeah, I don't be think, careful. I don't think they don't, don't always get along. <laughs> I don't think they like that about me. Will thou go back and correct the transcript now? I shall. <laughs> Uh, Judy, uh, you just uh, DM'd me in the in the chat. Uh, can do you want to either copy that into so everybody can see it, or just say it out loud? Because I really like the idea. Well, I was just thinking that it would be interesting. I fall into the category of spiritual, but not religious. But it goes beyond sort of all religions in scope because it would be interesting, I think, to talk about spirituality in the context of honor for all things, animal, earth air, stars, et cetera, rather than the human need to frame in a human structure. Well, that sounds like a good um, OGM call topic as well. Um, anyone care to title it or condense it or? Um... Maybe what is spirituality would be a big open question. <laughs> Are you there, God? <laughs> It's me. Well, I'm not, it's me, I'm you. Not, God, it's for me. <laughs> Sometimes it's for me, it's things like feeling connected to nature, the rhythm of the trees or the cycle of the seasons or the the change in the movement of the trees. I mean, it's a connection that is not human in itself, but it encompasses humanity, but much more. Judy said uh, honor for all things, which yeah. I think is a better term than spirituality. I'm tempted to make I'm tempted to make next Thursday's call title honor for all things. Sound reasonable? Done. Um, thanks, Judy. Great idea. Um, Sir Ken Homer, if thou hast a poet among thine books, <laughs> could thou shareth it with us? I could have indeed it. Perfect. <laughs> um, I, I pulled up several poems during this this call, um, but I think I'm going to go with Mary Oliver. Um, when death comes, when death comes like the hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut, when death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering what is it gonna be like, that cottage of darkness? And therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy, and as singular. And each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending, as all music does, toward silence. And each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say, all my life I was a bride married to amazement, and I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I've made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. What was the title of the poem, Ken? When Death Comes by Mary Oliver. I'll, I'll post it to the OGM. Uh, I put a link to a version of it, uh, I mean, a copy of it on the web in the chat, Judy. The, the, the last link in the chat is the poem. 
It's a beautiful poem. Thank you. Mary Oliver is a genius. She is. Was, yes. Yeah, was. Um, thank you all. We have a nice topic for next week. Um, ponder and share. Um, and thank you. Appreciate you being here.